Okay, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to my talk, which is, uh, yeah, I, I was, I'm tempted to say and for now for something completely different and uh, we'll be talking about uh, I2C multi-controller and uh, how to do controller target mode in QEMU. Um, so I'm the, uh, I'm a co-maintainer of the NVMe device in QEMU, so like why, why would I even care about I2C? Um, but the reason is the uh, NVMe management interface, so I want to be able to emulate that and the interface provides an out-of-band interface to uh, manage NVMe devices and enclosures, and it uses the management component transfer protocol. And this protocol can run on a various set of transports, one of them being uh, I2C or SMBus, and also on PCIe vendor-defined uh, messages as this out-of-band communication path. So this talk today is about the work we're doing to emulate the I2C binding. So the management uh, component transport protocol is, as I said, transport independent. Um, everything is transmitted in forms of packets. That's the unit of data transfer and the size of those are typically defined by the actual transport. And these packets are then assembled into messages and the messages are the, the content that's passed between these MTTP endpoints, which is basically a, a terminus it's the, uh, the entity that receives a message, handles it, and sends back a response. Um, so this talk is not about MCTP. It's about the requirements uh, there are to actually support MCTP in QEMU. So the goal of this work was to be able to launch an emulated uh, baseboard management control platform with an uh, NVMe MI device hooked up to the I2C bus. And because of the way MCTP works or the way MCTP uses I2C, this requires the target devices to be able to actually act as a controller on the bus, something that QEMU cannot handle prior to this work. And it also requires a mechanism for somehow having the data that these controllers or, or, or targets are sending back to, to the controller on the bus to be delivered to the host. Um, and this requires this uh, so-called target mode in the controllers, uh, which we'll also be looking at. So I2C is the inter-integrated circuit, and it's, it's a very simple bus. It's a synchronous controller target two-line serial bus. Um, and the way it works is that the controller will address a specific target on the bus by transmitting the address it wants to, of the target it wants to, uh, to communicate with. And if the target is there, it's going to acknowledge um, its presence, and then the controller can start transmitting data. This also works in the other direction. So as you can see here, we have something called a start and a stop condition, which is basically like a wire, uh, wire condition. And then the controller sends the address, which is seven bits, and then they send one bit to indicate whether it's a write or a read. And uh, if the host, or if the target acknowledges this, then the data can start flowing. And this will either be, like we're, Mostly in this work, we're interested in the transmission part. That's where the controller is always sending to the target. But the data packets can also be controlled by, uh, by, this, by, the, by the target, and the target will be the one driving um, the, the data line. But when you send these individual frames, which is one byte, you get an acknowledgment from the receiving party. And at some point, the controller says, OK, we, we got what we wanted, and it, it uh, uh, does a stop condition. Uh, and the transfer is done, or the full message has been sent. So in MCTP, it's based on the SM bus block write bus protocol, and it's basically just a, a layout of these messages that are predefined. So that's the start condition, the address, uh, the read write bit, which is always zero to indicate a write. Then there's a command frame that that is always set to uh, to uh, OXF to indicate MCTP. Then there's another data frame indicating how many bytes are in this transfer, uh, and then the, 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 the data bytes uh, start showing up. And in the end, you have something called a packet error code, which is just a CRC over the entire message. Um, but because MCTP uses these uh, block writes exclusively, the receiving party somehow has to know where to send its response to. So the first data byte uh, holds the um, the source address, I2C source address. Um, yeah. So 
uh, I squared C in QEMO is emulated with the I squared C bus um, uh, uh, Q bus. And you have a I squared C controller. There are various different uh, um, I squared C controllers that implements this that will own this I squared C bus and then the targets that you have, sensors, the NVMe MI device, stuff like that, they are children on this bus. And we try to emulate how the hardware works, so the controller will sort of send start and stop condition by issuing a uh, uh, I2C start send or start receive or the generic start transfer uh, onto the bus, uh, with the bus as the target, not, not with a targeting a specific target, you know, in the parameters. And the stop condition is, is with the end transfer. Um, so as soon as the transfer is set up, we can start sending or receiving bytes, and we do this with the I2C send and the I2C receive. Again, we're addressing the bus and not the particular uh, target here. And the acknowledgement or, 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 or not acknowledge of this is implicit in the return code of, of these calls. So when you have a target uh, and implements that, like a sensor, some, some kind of I2C basic I2C device, you have to implement a specific uh, device class. It's called the I2C slave class. And you implement the send and receive callbacks. And uh, these are called in response on the specific target that is the target of the current transaction um, uh, on these I2C send and receive calls. There's also an event callback that allows the target to react to the start transfers and the end transfer uh, stop and start conditions. So, uh, in the simple case, when you have a single controller transaction, it looks something like this. You have a, a controller that does this uh, I2C send and, and receive calls to the target. And it's just a synchronous thing. You do a start transfer, you start sending your bytes, and you do that in transfer. So the problem is now, how, how can this target, with this API, how can the target actually you know, reply to the controller? And before this worked, the, it just it couldn't, um, because the I2C core code couldn't support multiple controllers. But there's actually nothing in the API that sort of prevents the target from just getting a, uh, getting a, a reference to the bus and then just start sending. And, and this can actually be made to work, but it, you know, the, pr the problem here is that you end up having these uh, re uh, recursive end transfers and yeah, it's, it's a miss. So that's not the right way to do it. So uh, what does hardware actually do in this case? So in hardware, when you have multiple controllers, what happens is that you use a me arbitration mechanism where the uh, controllers will just try to sense on the bus if it's free or it's busy. And if it's, if it's not busy, then we take control of the bus and we start, uh, we start sending our message. So um, in QEMO, luckily, we can just have the controllers that wants to be a controller on the bus to, to line up nicely. And we can do this by registering a, uh, a callback in the form of a, uh, a button half. So the uh, solution here is that upon the end transfer and getting the finish the stop, uh, stop condition event, then the target device will try to acquire the bus and it does so by registering a button half on, on the bus. And at some point, uh, the I2C core code will schedule that, uh, that button half and then the target can uh, start the transfer, send the data back, and then you end up in a situation like this where you basically have two controllers uh, sending data to each other. And they, this works fine. But the problem is that this is not the full story because this controller, the sort of main controller that owns the bus, is controlled by something. And it's controlled by typically some kind of host I2C bus driver. Um, for instance, could be the A-speed uh, driver in Linux. And because that works with MMIO, uh, another problem with the old recursive way of doing things here would be that you would, you would end up blocking the guest while you were handling all this, and you could just keep going on and on and on, having the guest blocked, and nothing would really work. Um, so um, basically, it's, you have an MMIO write, you, you, you handle the, the, uh, the command, you start the transfer, then you get another bus write to, to actually send the data, um, but even if we introduce this new way of doing this, that when the command, the, f the full message has been sent to the target and we acquire the bus, then the problem with the getting the, the data back here becomes that these are totally synchronous. And 
for the driver to work, the driver needs to pick up the data before it can receive another one because there's only, there's only one byte register in the ASPEED model to, to, receive, uh, to receive a byte. So we sort of cannot just have the target synchronously send this stuff because we need this interrupt to be handled before we send the next byte because we somehow need this data to go back up into the bus driver. So we need some way to suspend the target at this point. So uh, the first problem, of course, <laughs> is actually that the uh, target devices, they don't implement the slave interface. So there's no, th there's no target of, of this transaction. And as I said, you end up overriding the data uh, in the target if you just implemented it naively. So uh, the way to, to make all this work is that the controllers can support something called target mode, which basically that they uh, are a, a, a target on their own bus. And it allows the host driver to read the data that is being sent to the device. Um, and it can read the data, it can acknowledge to the controller that it read the data, and then the controller can, can uh, begin uh, or can continue from there. So uh, again, no controllers in Qingyun supported this. Um, and the biggest problem here is that it breaks this fundamental rule in the I2C core code that all transfers must complete immediately. Um, so we sort of have the first problem we need to fix, and that is to fix this constraint that the transfers are synchronous. So we do this by basically adding a new asynchronous version of the I2C send and a new uh, event into the event callback. And the cool thing here is that because we already have this, um, this infrastructure, that we already have this button half by the target being, uh, being uh, registered on the bus. So if we just reuse that button half and allow that button half to basically yield and turn it into a state machine, then these button halves knows if they are just getting starting on the, on this, on the send, if they are in the process of sending a byte, if the byte has been acknowledged, uh, and stuff like that, so we can, we can add that. So to finalize the transfer, we, we also add a new uh, command, uh, a new uh, function in the I2C called the I2C act, which basically is the same thing as returning uh, an integer, but instead we are in returning explicitly at a later stage that yes, now we got the byte. Um, the cool thing also is that this doesn't impact any of the existing device models. So all the sensors, all the other targets that are synchronous in nature, then can just continue being synchronous in nature. And the asynchronous device models like the, the I2C board controllers, um, they can just choose not to implement the synchronous version. They only implement the asynchronous version. The second thing we had to solve was adding this target mode support. And we choose the A-speed to do this and the reason we did that is because the Linux kernel driver has nice support for this already. And also in QMU, uh, the, the authors of the ASP uh, controller model, they sort of left it as a fill in the blanks game. So it, the code was all filled with uh, to, to do, gotta <laughs> make slave mode work, stuff like that. So given the code in the Linux kernel and the driver code, it was actually surprisingly straightforward to, to know what interrupts to raise at the right points and stuff like that. So, um, so this is already in upstream queuing. Um, so the way we, we did add the target mode, uh, apart from, um, from, uh, from just making sure we get, got the right uh, uh, interrupts handled, it was also that we basically added another uh, target directly on the bus. And this target, as I mentioned, only implements the asynchronous callback and it implements the, the, the event callback. And what will happen is that whenever it gets something on the center sync, it will copy that uh, data into its byte buff register and it will raise an interrupt to tell the host that there's data waiting. The host driver will pick up that data and it will uh, acknowledge the interrupt and then the, the device model, the ASPEED device model, will acknowledge on the bus that uh, we can get ready for the next byte. So it starts looking like something like this. The, uh, when, when we're done sending the, the, uh, uh, sending the message or the, the, the MCTP packet to the target, 
We're gonna end the transfer, and then the target over here is gonna acquire the bus. So it will process the command, it will make a response ready. It will do the uh, asynchronous, uh, um, that it will indicate to the ASP that it wants to start an asynchronous uh, transfer. And the uh, host driver will acknowledge that it slave mode is, is enabled, we're ready, you can start sending data. Um, and then we basically do a dance here where we continue doing the async uh, send with a byte. And when it's acknowledged by the host driver, we do the act and this continues until the full message has been sent. And finally, the button hat will end the transfer and release the bus. So to put this to work, uh, what we did was uh, add a abstract uh, NCTP target device. So we made a I2C target that implements the basics or the core of MCTP. That is, it handles uh, the I2C transport, it handles setting up the right CSC calculations, encapsulating the MCTP data. Uh, it also handles something called MCTP control messages, which is about setting up the MCTP network. Um, and then it implements these send and, and, and uh, event callbacks. So this is a synchronous device on its own because all it needs to do is soak up the message, and as soon as the full message is there, it can deliver it to a deriving device that implements the actual uh, MCTP message type, in this case, uh, NVMe MI. And when the, when the data for the response is ready, um, it can, uh, the deriving device can call the I2C MCTP schedule sent, which is just a way of getting all this asynchronous um, uh, mechanism working or started, and then the we will we'll basically end up in in uh, in this where the, the uh, abstract device will take care of you know packet by packet sending the uh, the data back to the host. Um, so to get all this running and and getting up and running and trying it out, um, the uh, framework in the kernel that handles MCTP needs to. Uh, be aware that there is an MCTP uh, controller um, available. So in this case, you can modify the, uh, the device tree and tell it this, uh, we support Multimaster, there's an MCTP controller on this bus, and that uh, specifically at this uh, I2C address, there is an I2C controller that supports slave mode, and we want the slave mode to be set up at, at this address. Um, so when we launch this, we use uh, just the system arc, we choose the A-speed uh, uh, 2600 evaluation board. Um, we have a kernel supporting I2C and the MCTP framework. We have a super simple root file system and then our modified uh, device uh, tree. And then we add this NVMe MI I2C based device, uh, giving it an I2C address and a, a MCTP endpoint ID. And as it loads up, we'll see the MCTP call in the kernel being registered. You'll see that it'll add a, um, a, uh, a slave device on the, um, on, the, on the bus. And then we can suddenly start using this entire framework that, uh, that is, has only recently been added to the kernel. So this MCTP tool works sort of like the IP route uh, commands. So you, you set up an address for, so you tell it that on this particular interface, I'm gonna give myself the, I2, like the MCTP endpoint ID 8, and I'm gonna bring the link up, then I'm gonna add a route to this device on, on that interface, and because this is uh, an I2C based transport, we need to tell uh, the routing mechanics inside the kernel that it's available at, at this address. And with all this, this, basically with these four commands, then the MCTP stack is bootstrapped and, and we basically have an MCTP network running. And now we can use this to exercise the, uh, the MCTP commands and the NVMe MI uh, device. So we can, can use this tool that's included uh, in LibNVMe as an example tool and basically uh, communicate over I2C directly from the host with, uh, with the NVMe device and, and getting this stuff out. So there's still some work to do. Um, so when I posted this, 
there were a surprising amount of uh, interest in it. So the work that Peter is doing on upstreaming all of the, uh, the, the meta uh, baseboard management controllers apparently used target mode or multi-master functionality exclu uh, extensively. So, but he raised the issue that right now, two A-speed controllers, and there's one of the boards that basically is a 2600 and a 1030, I think, that wants to communicate over I2C. But the problem right now is that they can't do that because the controller transmits are always done synchronously. So we need some way of changing the logic inside the A-speed to basically say, if I'm targeting an asynchronous device, then I need to use the asynchronous API. And uh, so Peter and I talked a, a little bit about that and it, uh, we definitely have a good, way, uh, a good idea about how to solve this. Also, because MCTP is exclusively uh, transfers, then currently the target mode uh, inside the uh, ASP doesn't support the target mode re receive, so it can only send data, it can only do the MCTP block write. So uh, that's it for my talk. I don't know if there's any questions on this. Uh, yeah, so, so so the question is, I think, if uh, if we could just do one control, basically without, uh, not having any arbitration, but just. Yeah. Yeah, so so I, I guess that's possible, but the, the, um, the core idea here was to actually hook into, be, we wanted to be able to make sure that we could just have a, 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 a target device that we hooked up on the same bus as all the other devices there that could be sensors and everything else. And we somehow wanted to use the same API, the same I2C call to, to do this transfer. And, and as I mentioned, the, actually the biggest problem was the, you know, the, the, the need for the asynchronous uh, part. The, the multi-master was actually not, that, that w I had an initial solution <laughs> that, was, that was basically just swabbing around when the, the, the target was removed from the, the active target was removed from the bus. But you still ended up in this that you were, when you actually were driven by the, the target controller, then you're in a, a VM exit and, and you are blocking everything. So, so that there needed to be some way of yielding and that was the reason we did like this. So uh, the, the question is if you have to provide your own device tree. So if you, um, if you build this on, say, the A-speed, which right now is the only one that supports this, um, then, then the only thing you need to do is, is this is this is the size of the overlay you need to do. So you just need to, and, and this is not because the, the QEM or anything like that requires this. Uh, this is only because the, uh, the kernel driver needs this attribute to know to initialize on that uh, on that device, but you can. Uh, so I know that uh, Jonathan Cameron did a um, uh, uh, did some work with the MultiMaster and the I2C stuff, where he baked in the device directly into the board. Like here, we are adding it, uh, you know, dynamically, but he built it into a the A speed and he uh, basically set up the uh, device tree from within. So, so you can bake it into, a, into it. So if you build your board and the board you know, includes a static uh, device, then you can build it into the uh, device tree directly. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.